Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddy Network Podcast. My guest today is Phil Gerbyshack, a repeat and returned uh, guest from last year. And we're going to, we have an unscripted conversation, as they all are, but we have a point to talk about, which is how to find happiness in the midst of transition. So, Phil, uh, you just told me something that kind of shocking is not this not the word but kind of oh wow that's cool uh so tell us a little bit about what what you're up to sure well let's uh let's rewind a little bit because i think it's important to talk about where i've been not all of it but just a little bit right the last year i turned 50 of course, of course right i turned 50 this past year so turning 50 is a big deal um, it's not like I've got, oh my gosh, I got to go buy a Porsche though. You know what, Ed, I've got a fa I've got a picture of one there. I've got a picture of a lot That's of a nice Porsche. Thing. Yeah. It's a beautiful Porsche, but you know what? I recognize also, I'm not at all driven by that. Like it doesn't motivate me. I know. What motivates me is to make a difference. So turning 50, I, uh, I lost a job, uh, in right before my 50th birthday. And so I reevaluated my life and I said, you know, am I really where I want to be? Do I want to do more of this job? Stuff like this. And maybe, maybe I'll do some of that. Or maybe I want to teach and impact kids in a different way. I'm fortunate. I've got two amazing bonus children. I've got an eight-year-old and I've got a 17-year-old. And 25, 30 years ago, when I got out of the Navy, Ed, I went to school to teach and I never finished my degree, uh, not in education. I have a degree in computer science, but I never went and taught. I mean, I did, I did my student, some of my student teaching, but I never, ever, ever got credentialed. Well, I thought, huh, I might want to do that. And I I never really thought seriously about it because I was like, eh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Well, I talked to my wife and she's like, well, why don't you see? So in, January, I started looking into how to be a substitute in the state of Ohio. And today, as we're talking, I took my substitute teacher orientation. And right before we got on, I opened myself up to 22 schools that are nearby me to be a substitute teacher starting tomorrow. Fantastic. Oh, my. That, I, just, I just see so many opportunities that come from this. Mm -hmm. I, I see every every one of those students that you will encounter having a positive experience with a substitute teacher who tells them something about what their future can be that's positive and aspirational and and um, fun. You know, all of those yeah. all those things. Absolutely. So I'm excited. I'm excited for me because I get this opportunity. This is. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, there, there are movies out there where there's a, you know, there, one of the, one of the themes is the substitute teacher who comes in and uh, disrupts the, the class and, you know, in a positive way. And, you know, this, so maybe we'll see a movie about you in 10 years. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm Edward James almost or not, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. That well, that was a great. That was a great one. Uh, what is that? Stand and deliver. Is that what? Wasn't that that movie? That I believe so. Yes, I believe uh, so. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And um, I'm thinking of others that were were like that. Well, oh yeah, there's so many of them. Well, there's Goodbye, Mr. Chips. I don't know if you. Oh ever, yeah. Which was done twice. You know, it was done back in the 30s with Robert uh, Donat, and then it was done in the. Uh, 60s or 70s with uh, Sidney Poitier. Uh, I think it was him. Anyway, well, that's that's great, and uh, I think that'll be that'll be fantastic. Yeah, so, thank you. So this is a transition for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you feel any trepidation about this? Any concerns? Oh no, this is all easy. Of course I do. I'm scared out of my mind. I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I really don't. I mean, I know that, you know, stand and deliver, right? I can stand in front of a classroom and I can talk about anything. 
You give me a lesson plan. I'm not worried about that. My question is, how are the kids going to respond? How am I going to do when it comes to classroom management? What happens when things don't go right? What happens when, so here's the other crazy thing. It takes three weeks to get a paycheck. So I'm looking at the days. I was actually, I'm, I'm writing down all the days that I can work because I've got other stuff that's cooking, right? This I've already got commitments. So I'm looking, I'm like, wow, that's it. Huh? So I'm going to work. It looks like right now I've probably got about 45 or 50 days before the end of the year that I can work but it doesn't pay right away. So I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I got to fill in the gaps with other stuff. And then as I fill in the gaps with other stuff, maybe I can do that less. So maybe I have to do it more. I don't know. Do I have to get another job to pay the bills? I don't know, right? Like I really don't know. There's a lot of trepidation, absolutely. But what you have is a collection of opportunities that mm -hmm. you're going to manage with with um, purpose and agility and all of those things. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I've never been here before, but I've been in the suck of this before, right. Of all the unknown and all of this. And I've been okay. I mean, I've made it this far, so I'm confident that I will make it through, but do I have some trepidation? Of course I do. I would be, I, I would be inhuman to not have any trepidation. I mean, this is a lot of change. This is this is as new to me Ed, as it is to you in some ways. Well, I've I've been there where you are, even with this age group. Oh, well, tell me then. Give me give me some nuggets, man. Well, when I graduated from college in 1975, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a, a career. I didn't have a future purpose. I didn't know what I was going to do. But what I had been doing during college was um, I was part of a ministry to high school students. And the uh, the last year that I was a participant in that, I was the I was the director of that. I was the lead. You know, we're all volunteers, but there were seven or eight of students who were working at this one high school. And, and what we did was we just built relationships with students. That's all we did. And so I ended up um, finishing and then signing up for the training program of this ministry. And they sent me to uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And they gave me two schools to start a program, uh, two schools, one in which I had to start the program. You know, and, and I didn't know anything, but this, the program was going to start because there were some parents some families in that school district that wanted to see this ministry there. And, and back then, this was the 70s. It was a much different time. And, and I was allowed to kind of walk into the school and hang out. You know, I'd go hang out in the cafeteria. I'd go to, I'd go to football practice. I would, you know, and I built relationships with students. And, and I didn't go as... I mean, here I am about four or five years older than them. I mean, I'm 20, at this point, I'm 21, you know, and they're, they're 17 or 18 or 16. So, you know, we're close in age. And we became, we became friends, even though I was in a position of um, somewhat authority, you know, I still built relationships. And, and it was such that I could go hang out with them and, at that age. But that, but that ability to talk with them uh, was facilitated over and over again over the years. And I still do that now. You know, I, I go find, um, you know, I'm, I'm in a place and I see young people and I, I just go strike up a conversation, you know, and, and who's this old guy coming to talk to them? Well, I'm not acting like an old guy. I'm acting like I'm just a guy who's interested in, and who they are and what they think. And I, and I think I think the thing which is most important is treating them with the respect that they have something to say that matters. And I, I get the impression that they feel like most of the people my age are not listening to them or that most of the people your age are not listening to them and they don't have any... And so they're, they've tuned us already, they've already tuned us out. So that kind of, I, this is an intergenerational kind of thing. 
And so they tuned us out because we have tuned them out. And so how do we how do we break that that log jam that that ice ice jam and and allow the the flow of conversation to begin to happen again? Yeah. Well, I think your point about listening and being present, asking questions and not judging, I think is probably the best advice uh, to do that. And I still. I still struggle with that with my daughter. We don't know. We don't connect very well. And so I'm working on that with her. And I know that I have, uh, I know that I have some crap to eat to make things better to, to sure. you know, because it, it's, I would, I would say it's more than a ice jam. It's really a bridge that has to be built. That's true. And so that's really what, uh, that's what I need to work on. And that is, um, yeah, that's going to be hard. Um, so here, here's the second thing I did. Yeah. Uh, in 2001, I took over the leadership of my son's Boy Scout troop. And at that point in time, we had about 12 boys involved, and there were three of us adults involved. And then there was a, a parent parent committee. And uh, I had never done any of this stuff before. I didn't know what I was doing. So I told my son, my two sons, said, I want you to tell me what I need to do. I want you to, we're going to debrief what we're doing every week. And we're going to debrief on the way home from our meeting. Because I want to understand what, what we need to do. So they became my counselors. And so there may be, I mean, if you are able to develop relationships with some of these young people, they become your counselors and they become your support team. If you end up where you say you're, you're stepping into a, a class where the woman has is taking um, maternity leave. And so you're going to be assigned there for a long time, you know, that then you can actually build those relationships. So what, what happened is that um, I had to, uh, to learn how to talk to these kids and they had to, I had to learn to listen to what they were saying. But what I found was I really, I really like the middle school kids and particularly when they were you know, when they're like 11 and a half, 12 years old, their, their, their perception of the world is opening up for the first time and they want the whole thing. They want, they want the whole world to come to them. Then when they turn 14, 15, you know, they, you know, hormones begin to change and they, they begin to focus on college and they begin to focus on, you know, getting a job to buy a car, you know, that sort of thing. But when they're young at, in middle school, if the things are opening up to them. It's a time of trauma for them, but it's also a time of openness. And and um, and I, if I was to do what you're doing, I would be. I would go for middle school. I think. Well, I think that's what I'm going to try to do because I also want to coach. I oh. want to really, you know, I I want. Uh, and my son is in second grade, so that'll give me some run there that yeah. I can kind of get a little bit established, because uh, the hope is in the fall to get a full time teaching job. That's a good so, idea. That's a great, yeah. that's great. And, and so this is, um, it's going to define the next 20 years of your life. At least. Yeah, it sure is. Absolutely. This is going to create the legacy that you will have. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah. You know, and, and uh, I saw a commercial the other day, or maybe it's a YouTube video of, of, um, it was telling the story of a kindergarten teacher and her last class had just graduated from high school and they had come to her house to see her, you know, and they walk through the garden gate and she sees them and she knows who they are. And, you know, it's a special, it's a special moment where they have come to thank her for being their kindergarten teacher. And, uh, and that as they are beginning to, to step out into their, into their life as a, as young adults. Yeah. Well, and I think about Mr. Holland's opus, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's my, that's probably, uh, that and dead poet society are kind of the teacher movies I think about, but I'll tell you, Ed, my, I'm, first of all, I'm from a little itty bitty town. So I'm fortunate that, I, let's see my kindergarten teacher, my first grade teacher, my third grade teacher, my, or both my third grade teachers, my fourth grade teacher, my uh, my seventh grade teacher, like I've got teachers galore on my Facebook. So I get to see, 
I, I get to watch my classmates and other kids talk. And I say kids, boy, my age, right? We're not kids anymore, but kids of theirs yeah. that talk about the impact that they had. And, uh, and then I get to see, and I get to share the impact they've had on me. It's, I, uh, yeah. And then as, unfortunately, uh, over the last few years, we've lost a few of my teachers. We yeah. lost my, my superintendent. We lost my math teacher. Um, we've lost some folks. So I've been able to eulogize them as well and talk about the impact they've had on me um, and really try to be present with them. I, I, I totally get that. And uh, I've, I've just moved in the last week and I'm, I moved into a big house because I want to I want to have social events here. You know, and there's a large space here for that. Cool. And, and the first one that's going to happen will happen in late March. And it will be with a bunch of my friends from high school. And and one of the people that will be invited to come will be the assistant principal who's still alive. And awesome. every time we have met gathered before over the last couple of years, he has come. And it's it's so sweet. You know, it's um, you know, the the legacy of a teacher is uh, significant. And I'll give you one more one more story. So I'm in a downtown neighborhood, mix, mixed race neighborhood that's gentrifying. And um, I was standing out on my porch work of uh, 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 putting a mailbox on, you know, hanging a mailbox. And this this African American man about my age walks by and we say hello to each other and we start talking. And um, my I went to all white schools all the way through high school. And my um, football coach, my the head football coach, my senior year was was an African American man, and he had he had taught at the local university and and coached at the local university. He had also played Canadian football, and he had become our coach. And here he is t coaching in an all white school, and and this is the 1970s, early 1970s. And so you can imagine what was going on then. There was there was discrimination. There was you know talk behind the scenes. There was attempts to to um, to uh, undermine his authority, you know, by by coaches on the team, you know, it was it was a difficult thing, and we as the players saw this, and we watched him respond with such dignity and such grace. He never lowered himself to the the level of those who were attacking him. In fact, he would he would invite us over to his house. Now, back then, Winston Salem was a very divided community. So the black families lived on the east side and the white families lived on the west side. And, and he lived on the, and so this guy that's walking by, I mentioned to him, did, did you know Coach Holman? He says, oh yeah, we lived a couple of streets apart from each other. And it was, it was like, I want you to know who, the effect that he had on me that remains to this day. And, and so now he, this guy, Steve and I are going to be best friends because we share something about the people that we have known in our past that have had that kind of influence on us. That's awesome. That's so awesome. And, and you have that opportunity now. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm kind of envious of that. It, you know, if I didn't have these other things going on, I, I, I could see myself doing what you're doing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm nervously excited. And I think I'm, uh, I think I'm equal parts nervous and excited, if I'm being honest. So when you um, you look at the fall coming and you want to you you will get a full time job, what do you want to be teaching? Uh, business, technology, or uh, history. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah. So, but we'll see though. I'm going to substitute in every subject if I can. Yeah. I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm gonna break out of all comfort that I have and see what happens. And ha have you had to have an interview for this? No. <laughs> it is interesting. Well, they're hurting so badly for teachers that as long as you pass the background check, yeah, I mean, I, I won't know anybody. Now, that being said, once I'm there, I'm sure that they'll want to talk to me and, you know, because I guess teachers then can give you a favorite five. 
So if they really like you, they can put you on the fast list whenever they're on vacation so that you can get picked up. So that's interesting. I don't know. I, I really, uh, I went through two hours of orientation today and it kind of blew my mind. I was like, holy crap. Like I, it wasn't hard information, but it's a lot to absorb. And then like literally that finished an hour and a half ago and we're talking about it. And I still, I've got to sign up and see when I can teach, where I can teach. I mean, I need to talk to my wife about what's available and what she can do and what I can do because, you know, we have, our schedules have to match. Yeah. So what so, is it that the schools are looking for from a teacher? A pulse. From, huh? A pulse. Not be, I mean, really though, they're not right now. They're, they're hurting so badly for teachers that there are people that don't even have degrees that can be, a, be teachers. That right. So, yeah. So as long as you can pass the background check, um, you can be a teacher, at least a substitute, to be clear. What okay. are they looking for as a full-time? Ed, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I can get that, though, without my teaching certificate. But then I believe I have to go back and and uh, get, continue my education, which is fine. Yeah, you have to work on getting that certificate. It's kind That's of like, right. Like, it's kind of like becoming a professional psychotherapist. So you can get your degree, but you're not really a, a official until you've done your inter your that's right up in your in your in your whatever they call it that, that two years of, of work um mm -hmm. entered uh supervision before you right. can, yeah because well that makes sense but so here's a here's a okay i'm i'm taking a step away from this specific thing um and talk about um how organizations are looking at hiring people or how they're looking at qualifying people who should work for them in the future. And, and there are a lot of institutions that are having a, a hard time finding people to work. And I'm, I'm wondering what you, what you see in that, because you, I mean, you've been in the business world for a long time and you see mm -hmm. a lot of things. And I, you know, I was having conversation with a guy this morning and they were talking about his church and realizing that they're, they're fortunate to have held on to their pastor as long you know, but what the pastor has said is that he's, he's, uh, there, there are not a lot of opportunities out there. And so, so there's this, this sense that there are, there are opportunities, but they're not opportunities and there are people, but they're not people. And so there's this kind of very confused state that we're in business wise, where people are looking at, uh, the, the employment arena for themselves. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, we have too many requirements for most jobs that don't really need them. I really do. I mean, I think, that, you know, uh, okay, so let's take two a year from now. We're going to expect people to be experts in AI and artificial intelligence. I know of maybe one, maybe five people that are really experts in AI. Now, what does that mean? Uh, that means they've been using it for more than a year. But you're going to see on applications, five to 10 years experience with AI impossible right but they're going to list it i'm i can tell you that we're going to we see that all over the place your point about the pastor the other thing is i think people don't realize that their skills are transferable that's right a pastor a pastor could be an educator a pastor could be a counselor a pastor could be uh someone who creates content a but, pastor could be a speaker, a trainer. I mean, there's a hundred different jobs. A coach, pastor, a consultant. I mean, that's right. Facilitator, a, a keynote yeah. speaker. I mean, all, all these things. Yeah. But they don't see, they don't see their skills as transferable. I think that that's true of a lot of people. I mean, the military. It's the same way. People get out of the military and they're like, "Well, I don't see a job that says, you know, field artillery." Well, no kidding. The pro the problem is that. People are defined by their title and they're measured by their credentials. Mm -hmm. And they're not, the, uh, people don't have a clue as to whether these people can do anything. And just because someone can get a credential doesn't mean that they can do the work. That's so, right. So I think that we're in, the, in a transition period, a major transition period in terms of how organizations function. And, um, and if, you're, if you're like you and me, who have an, have an inclination to grow and to continue to learn things, we're going to be fine. But I think about the people who 
who want to want to just do the same job from year and year and year out and retire from that same job, they're they're not going to be a very happy camper come next year or the year after that or whatever. Yeah, I, I had a guy that I talked to about AI today on my show, Ed, and uh, he, it is not that AI is going to replace jobs. Oh, it will. I want to be clear. It will. It will. But what it's really doing, though, is AI is replacing people who refuse to change. Right. AI is refusing people who will take AI as artificial intelligence, which means I don't have to pay attention to it. And what it really is, is augmented intelligence. How can it augment to my brain and make it better? And the people that embrace it that way, see it as an augmentation to their intelligence, I think are going to win and thrive. And people who don't are going to suffer. Yeah, I I agree with you. It, to me, it doesn't factor into what I do on a regular basis very much. Um, Not yet. Not yet, but it, but it will, as I, as I see things moving forward, because it will, I'll, I'll be using it to uh, find people to have on this on the show for example because it at some point this show is going to expand to to be a, a sub i mean this is where i see it heading it'll expand to be a syndicated five day a week uh interview show because that's sure because the the interest in having unscripted conversations is such that that makes sense and so mm-hmm. at that point in time all that all that ai stuff becomes very valuable to me because I don't have to go research everything. Uh, I can just put it in there and it gives me what I need to make a decision. Yeah. Well, not only that, but but like we the last time we spoke, I took the transcript of our of our conversation. I right. chucked it up in the chat GPT. I asked it some questions. I told it to pull out a couple smart things that I said, and it created a whole article for me. Now, did I have to edit it, revise it a little bit? Sure. But as we have unscripted conversation, the the What's in common isn't always uh, visible to you right. and I, but it is to the AI because the AI will say, see the patterns that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And, I, and actually I see someone doing that for me because I, I want to focus on the conversation and, sure. and, and the, all the mechanics of, of this enterprise here, I give to someone who is actually younger and, and prepared to to do to take advantage of all of that, which sure, because they're a, they're a digital native, and I'm not, you know, I'm st- I'm still an analog uh, caveman. Right, but you understand it though. You know that it's there. I mean, I think you're not afraid of it. You just no. recognize that's not your gift. And I think again, that's the AI. Your augmentation of intelligence is another person. That's right. That's right. And that's perfect. That's perfect. Right. That's another thing. That job wouldn't have existed 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. Now that job of not editing the conversation, but finding the patterns and the nuance and creating those things that's available when as before it was not. Yeah. And it, it's so, it's so interesting to think about this. Um, you, you wonder when uh, um, I'm doing a circle back when AI becomes the teacher of the of the of the middle school history class. You know of history? Sure. Or in, in class. No, no, class. Hold on. No, but his history is a good example. Yeah. If you're just teaching dates, absolutely. If you're just teaching uh the same stories, absolutely. But if you're looking for synthesis, That's now it. you need a teacher. So I think the role of the teacher to facilitate conversation, to synthesize things that are seemingly disparate, to tell stories from the current time that connect to the past time, I think that is the, going to be the role of the teacher. What what you're saying is what I believe is to be true, is that AI is going to force us to be more creative in the work that we do, and it doesn't replace us. It, as you say, it's augmenting. And what it means is that we have to be more creative in how we interact and interface with all of this. And that that's going to have a far greater benefit. I mean, I, I mean, the way I look at it is that we're we're transitioning from a world that's existed for several, maybe four or five millennia, 
where you had a hierarchy of a few at the top of the hierarchy who, who led everybody else. And everybody else was more or less dependent upon them of the few at the top. And increasingly over, the, over the, our lifetime, they have become less important. The people at the top of the, these performance hierarchies have become less important and the people have become more important and the interaction between people has, has grown in importance. And, and we are gonna see that more and more. And so if your classroom, everyone in your classroom can take advantage of AI to make themselves more valuable in the conversation that happens within the classroom or within their team or whatever, that's, that, you see, that's going to be the, the game changer, I think. Yeah. yeah, if we let that happen, though, here's the challenge. Think about there are top four already in AI. There's, there's OpenAI, there's Microsoft there's Google. And then I think Apple has got something going on already. So there's already a new hierarchy. And with capitalism, capitalism says we have to extrude as much value out of people as we can. So I think that the hierarchy has actually grown. We just feel it. We natively feel it less, but it's actually there more. Except that they have released the they have released the innovation so that it is in our hands now. And for now, well, if they choose not to, we will have already learned how to talk with each other. And we'll, we will find whether AI actually is the game changer or whether it's not. And actually, whether the game changer is actually the fact that you and I can have an intelligent conversation. And in that conversation, discover we, we share some ideas that maybe we should go work together on. Yeah. And and if we see if we treat our relationships as um, as one of uh, respect and trust, but also of, of mutual um, accountability, but even more so of collaboration for shared goals and shared impact, then we're going to find that these the, the technology that has been created are tools for us rather than the overseers of us. That's sure. If that's we right. focus on collaboration, not exploitation. That's right. I'm 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 with you. I'd love to, I hope that's true. Well, the challenge is that we're gonna see, unless there's some, and, and I'm not trying to be political here, but unless we see that there's some sort of universal basic income and that everyone gets access to the same large language models. Because right now, the, you think about if, if AI was as proliferant as it could be. We won't. We don't have enough electricity. The internet would melt. That's right. So, but right, because right now there's still a striation of the haves and the have-nots as far as the AI goes. Not. It's not just true about AI. It's about all every technology oh, yeah. that's been created has has created its own um, the conditions for its own demise. Mm -hmm. And and no one is really dealing with this because they because they're passing. They're kicking the can down the street. No one is really dealing with electrification infrastructure. And um, and where did I say? I think I saw a headline the other day that BMW is not going to do any more electric vehicles. It's it's moving into hydrogen. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. That's a that's a game changer. I, I think. Yeah. So so my my sense is that the work the people think because they've been told to think this way, that the world operates on a on a trajectory that's flat and it grows, it's progressive, but it's linear. And I don't think it's that way at all. I think no. it's cyclical. You know, we, we keep repeating the same mistakes, but, we, but every time we make the mistakes, we learn from it and we progress forward, but we keep having to return to the mistakes to learn how to overcome the next iteration of the mistakes with, with that we have made. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think you're definitely right. And for that reason, I think that, you know, where we'll be in, a, in 10 years, no one really knows. I think everybody wants to predict this. I, I think all the futurists are, you know, are, are smoking weed or something. I don't know. They, 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 they're, they're basing, they're basing their thinking on data, which is, is derivative of the past. And I think the past increasingly is less 
dependable for predicting what's going to happen in the future. I agree, right? The math that we need in the future doesn't exist. Yes. I totally agree with you, right? And we think about, yeah, we, we use last year's models. Well, last year's models are incomplete when it comes to next year. That's last right. year's models barely work for this year. That's that, right. I mean, it's like predicting the weather. Like, what's the weather going to be like? Well, their meteorologists are really good, but they're still not 100% accurate. All I know is that the weather's going to happen out there. That's well, that's the other thing. Yeah. Right. No, the, it's going to happen up there or maybe over there well, or what about the, there. But it is outside my house. Yeah. Right. And I don't have to worry about it as much because I'm indoors. That's right. And I'm, you know, uh, I have a friend who's very weather oriented. He lives on the West Coast. And, um, you know, he's 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 tracking weather all the time. And he he's making predictions that are better than the than the meteorologist. Uh, because he's really he's really smart he's really good at this and uh yeah it's 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 interesting to watch him talk about this because it's uh you know it it shows that that a lot of our thinking is based on too little information yeah and the it's it's the low hanging fruit of information that it's being based on and it's not mm -hmm. not really uh providing us enough for for the future i agree and so, so when we, when we started talking, we, we were talking about happiness in the midst of transition. So we're talking about maybe the most significant transition that has happened in human history that we're in the midst of right now. We mm -hmm. don't really know that. I'm suggesting that it is. Um, so how do we find happiness in the midst of this chaotic world of change? Well, we can focus on what we know All and right. embrace what we know. So we know people, we know love. There aren't a lot of constants otherwise. So embrace those. And then look back a little bit to be grateful. Look at what's happened in our life and be grateful. And yeah. just like me, recognize that it's going to change and you've never dealt with it before, but you've made it this far and you'll make it through it again. I yeah. think that's probably the way to find happiness and then just accept that i'm not telling you to love that i'm not telling you to embrace that i'm telling you to accept that yeah right acceptance is the key we have to accept i i totally agree with you and with come with acceptance comes openness to what is possible that's right and and when we are willing to accept what is possible we will then begin to see how the possible has something of value to us and, you know, when I decided I would move here, I, I moved to Winston-Salem, my hometown. And uh, three months ago, this was not on the map. Two months ago, it was barely on the map. I, I, and, and here I am in this new home. And, and I have no idea what really is coming. All I'm doing is reconnecting with old friends from high school and other people that I've known from college and those things. And I'm... Um, just trying to um, to figure out, okay, what's to, what's tomorrow need to do? You know, how do I how do I uh, you know finish cleaning the you know getting the kitchen in order? It's over there. It's a it's a huge mess. How do I get that in order? And how do I get my library in order upstairs? And how do I, how do I do that? But how do I do that in a way that opens me up to new people coming into my life and being a part of? of some endeavor that we together decide is important for our community. You know, that's, that's where happiness comes from me is, you know, is, is joining with some people to do things that really matter. Yeah. Well, for me, it's about belonging to a greater big. Yeah. yeah. You know, I want to belong. I, I want to be part of the community. Like I'm fairly new to Ohio. I've only been here about six months, so I'm still learning how to belong and what that means. So I'm excited. Again, being this will immerse me in head first. This is, you know, this is the the duck that's going underwater as, as deep as he can, and will come back uh, something new. Well, I could predict, though I'm not predicting, but I could see how your your injection or inclusion into the the school system um, can change the whole rather than just a few lives in the classroom and that your perspective and your energy and, and your experience will um, 
well, it's going to rub some people the wrong way. Um, oh, yeah. But it's also going to show what is possible in the future. And um, that to me is, you know, what the, the relationship you have with students is going to be fantastic. But the relationship you have with the system, I think, is going to is going to be a real challenge. But I think that's where the real long term benefit will come from. Because just as we have talked about all this change going on, your school system is going to be going through that change and you're going to be an agent for, for positive change and, and uh, ways of doing that and that makes sense for the whole. Yeah, I think so. And I'm, I'm very continue to just, yeah, it's still, I'm still processing it. <laughs> I'm sure, and you will for a long time. But it, but I see that possibility. Yeah, because someone who I mean, I, I describe you as a person of impact, because you want to you want to make a difference that matters, and yeah. you're going to take initiative to do that. I see you as that kind of the, the definition that um, you know I describe in in the book Circle of Impact. You know, that's the way I see I see you, and I see that. It, it is impossible for you to enter into that system without you having a um, a beneficial impact upon it. Not knowing what even that looks like at the outset, right? But it will it will emerge as as you go through it. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. That's all I can really say. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a change. It's going to be a challenge. I'm up for it. Well, I'm happy for you, and I'm Thank I'm. You. I, I am, what's the, what's the other way of saying this? I have deep respect for your willingness to start something new at the age of 50. Thank you. And that, that, that's the, that has a potential impact beyond the school system to all the people that know you and, and hear that you're doing this. It tells them that I can make a change. I can do something new and you know, and and you're a little, you're a tad older than most of the people who enter into that kind of uh, questioning about where they are. You know, when they're mid forties, people begin to question: Do I want to do this for the rest of my career? Do I want to stay in this company? Do I want to make a change? And I've seen a lot of that um, to the extent that I I think it becomes an archetype. The forty-ish business person is an archetype for people who want to make a transition into something new as they look at the last half of their career and they say, I want, I want to be in a different place where I can make a difference that matters. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and you're sure. going to do that. Thank you. I'll cheer you on. And um, so I, I look forward and I look forward to seeing how your, your children uh, uh, respond to this. Cause me too, because you know, you're, you're living, you're living your life out in front of them and they, they see the good and the, and the less good. And, and, uh, and all you can do is say, well, don't, don't do as I say, but do as I do, you know, in that sense of, okay, I'm sorry, I, I should have said this another way or something like that. But that's, but that's also what a teacher has to do as well, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I wish you well. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. It's going to be fun. That's great. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you all for watching. And we'll see you next time here on the Eddie Network Podcast. Bye-bye.